I would go and I would contact people and say, hey, I noticed you're doing this on Twitter. You know, these numbers aren't real. And sometimes that would be the call where I'm basically saying, did you know your baby's ugly? And they didn't know their baby was ugly and they thought their baby was beautiful. And then I said, nope. Nope, really, no. It makes a you know a Mexican hairless uh, Chihuahua look good. So yeah, you know. So nope, y- your baby. Yeah, no. It, it it's it's pretty ugly. My name is Carrie Green, and I am the client happiness guy at PodcastFastTrack dot com, and this is Podcastification. This show is all about podcasting, how to do it, how not to do it, best practices, interesting news items that have to do with the realm of podcasting, and who knows what else. And I'm trying to do it all with a little bit of fun and some information to help you get a show going, keep yours going, or make it better. And if you like what's going on here on the show, I would appreciate it, oh, so appreciate it, if you could leave a rating or review on iTunes. You can find out how to do that at podcastfasttrack.com slash review. That's enough of that kind of stuff. Let's get you podcastificated right away. Stats. Statistics, numbers, analytics, those are the things we'll be talking about today. And I think it's an important subject because a lot of podcasters, especially if you've been new to the scene in the last, I don't know, year or so, you may not understand the significance that your stats can have because they tell you a lot about how your show is doing, where it's being listened to, and all kinds of things you can do to actually attempt improvement to the number of listeners that you get. But you could also be on the other side and be one of those people that my guest today calls a stats addict. And he's got some pretty straightforward and strong words about that. We're going to be talking with Rob Walsh, a guest on my show on a previous episode of Podcastification, about stats, why they're important, what they are, what the myths are, and everything else in between, including the new and noteworthy category on iTunes, and how it's chosen. So sit back, relax, grab something to drink, and listen to this conversation I had with Rob Walsh of Libsyn. Rob Walsh, how are you doing today? I am doing excellent, Carrie. How are you? I am doing well. It's been a a crazy kind of a month, and it's only just begun. So it's nice to have you on on the show today. Hey, we are going to talk about stats And uh, when I talk about stats, I think immediately of things like number of downloads that I've gotten on my show and, you know, number of devices and who's using and listening on what device and that sort of stuff. Why don't you, being a guy that deals with stats all the time, give us just kind of your overview picture of what you think of when you think of stats. Well, I always try to think of stats in what has my most recent episode done in the last four weeks? So my most recent episode that's four weeks old, how's it doing? How's it compared to the episode before that and the one before that? I tend to look at trends on a per episode basis. I I love people, they'll say, I get this amount of downloads per month. That's meaningless. doesn't mean much. You could release 20 episodes a day, every day of the, the week, and still give a monthly number and have it less than what somebody else is doing with one episode. Ultimately, what people want to know is your kind of your unique audience. And that's a per episode. So when I think stats, I try to think per episode. And why do you think four weeks? Why are you picking that time frame? Within four weeks, you've really hit your core audience. That's where you're going to see most of your responses. At that point, if they haven't listened when you released within four weeks, then they're, they're kind of stumbling upon it later on. In addition, advertisers, that's where they want to know. Uh, you want to know what your numbers are because they're going to pay you based on what your downloads are in that first month. So that's what advertisers are looking for. And I think that's also where your relevant audience is. In reality, when I release an episode, uh, when I get feedback for that episode, it's usually within the first two weeks. But every now and then I'll still get an email from somebody within uh, you know, maybe three weeks after an episode or you know, maybe up to four weeks. But it's rare, rare, very rare that I'll get an email from someone from an episode I released six months ago saying, hey, I have a question about this or you know, here's an answer to someone's question on this. They'll let that go. 
about the only time I'll ever hear from someone when it's six months old or older is, hey, you were wrong. You said this was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, human nature to uh, focus on the negative rather than the positive, I think. You deal with stats and with podcasters every day. What's your official title there, VP of Podcaster Relations? Is that is that what it is? VP of Podcaster Relations, yes. Okay, so so as you interact with podcasters and you see the extremes that people go to in checking their stats or not checking their stats, give us some idea of, of where people are on that spectrum. Every now and then what we do, our stat processes, we'll, we'll pause it for a little bit to do some updating or maintenance or whatever it is. We'll pause it so that no stats are lost. But I'll get an email from someone that said, I checked my stats at 10 o'clock and now it's 11 o'clock and they haven't changed. What's going on? Oh my goodness. I'm like, do you check every hour? And they're like, yeah. We have people that will check every hour on the hour on the days they release an episode. Oh my goodness. Why do you think they're doing that? Addiction. (laughs) Uh, With self-confidence. I don't know. Um, Just total stat obsession. I try to tell people, don't. Don't check it. You want to check your stats? That's great. Check it. Right after you post your next episode, go and look at the stats for the previous ones. That's when I do. I look at my stats once a week when I release a new episode after the episode's released. And I go in and go and see how did the other episodes do. So you're looking at previous episodes when you go in. Right. And I'm not looking at, I don't know how many downloads my most recent episode had that went up um, because I haven't released my next episode yet. So when I release my next one this weekend, I'll look at the one that I released, I think it was on Friday, and I'll see how that did when I release the next one. But yeah, I I try to not look at the current one during the week uh, that it's released. I try to stay away from the stats. That totally makes sense to me. I I can hear though somebody saying, Well, if you're not tracking things, how do you know if they're being effective, et cetera? And what I hear you saying is checking it the day of is no more effective. Actually, it's probably less effective than checking it a week later. Well, when you go and you check a week later, you can see how it did the day of and the next day and the next day and the next day. And then I only have to look one time to see how that show did when it rolled out rather than going in multiple times. And all the time I save not checking stats is time I can spend sleeping or working on more content. So, yeah, I mean, every minute you spend looking at and obsess- obsessing over stats is one less minute you spend putting towards good content towards your show. Yeah, so most like most addictions, it's probably a time waster more than it is anything else. I have everybody else's stats to get addicted on. So I, I spend <laughs> a lot of time during a week working on stats, just not my own show stats. So I've broken the habit on my own show to, to go and obsess over everybody else's stats in aggregate. Yeah. And what is your purpose in doing that as the VP of Podcaster Relations? What are you trying to understand so that you can better help podcasters? I want to understand trends. I mean, one of the most recent ones, we just, if, if you listen to the latest episode of the feed, it was uh, episode 93, I, I talk about, this bad myth out there that podcasts need to be 25 minutes or less. You know, that's, you know, this, you read so many articles that say, oh, your podcast needs to be under, under 30 minutes, under 25 minutes, around 20 minutes. That's the ideal spot. That's how long people listen for. And I'm thinking, well, that's not what we're seeing. What we're seeing is the long shows are the most popular shows. So rather than thinking what I'm seeing, I went and I looked at stats and I pulled stats. And what we found was, I look at all the episodes that were released in the month of January and measured them at the end of February. So on average, each episode was 45 days, nothing less than 28 days, nothing more than 60 days, right? So I looked at all those from January and I looked at all the episodes that got over 100,000 downloads. And then I looked at those shows and I looked at the average length of episode for each of those shows. And then when I looked at that, what I found was of the shows that were getting 100,000 downloads or more, 84% were 51 minutes or longer. Only 9.9% were 30 minutes or less, and 13.2% were two hours or longer. So there were more shows that were two hours or longer getting 100,000 or more than there were 30 minutes or less. So back to those people that say, oh, shorter shows are better and they're going to be better for your growth. That's complete BS because the stats prove it out. The stats show what people are actually listening to, not what people think people are listening to or what people say their attention span is, but what people are actually downloading and listening to. And that is longer shows. Isn't that one of the greatest values of stats? I mean, I think I think about the business I do of producing audio and writing show notes and things like that, that my company does. And I get my opinions made based on observation, 
but they're still just my opinions, even though I'm quote unquote an expert at what I do. I still have to verify that opinion to be able to say it factually that this is what's happening. And that's what stats do for us, right? Exactly. And this is a perfect example of where stats come into play, where people are going out spreading misinformation based on nothing but assumptions in some surveys. Whereas we can actually look and say, no, 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 that's not right. And here are actual hard facts and stats to prove that what those other folks are saying about 25 and 20 minutes or shorter is wrong, that longer shows are actually doing well. Now, I always preface when I say these longer shows, and I, and I, and I want to preface this, don't take a 15-minute show, you know, you have 15 minutes of content and spread it out over two hours and expect your show numbers to grow. Uh, that, <laughs> that's called Star Wars Episode One. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Lucas did 15 minutes of good content, made it a two-hour movie, and it was a bad movie. If you have a 15 minutes of content, you do a 15 minute episode. But what I want to say is if you have an hour's worth of content, don't take it and split it into two 30 minute episodes because you think no one's going to listen to an hour's episode. They actually will listen to the hour's episode or two hours or in case of Dan Carlin, five or more hours. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a, a little deeper dive question about that number you just gave us of those episodes over 100,000 downloads. How many shows in total? Or how many episodes in total, rather, was that that you were looking at when you found all the shows that had 100,000 or more? It was shows and episodes were triple digits, and that's all. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so triple. triple yeah. So, so in the hundreds, numbers of, of shows. So the reason I ask that question is because I just want to give people an idea of the scope of this research that you're doing. This isn't just 10 shows with 100,000 downloads or more. This is a significant number. Yeah, and it, it was a significant number of episodes it might i have to go back and look i don't i think it was close to four digits on the episodes it was close to right around a thousand on the episodes wow so this is significant in terms of stats to bust that myth and one of the things that that tells me is when i hear a so-called podcasting expert out there recommending to people that they should have shorter episodes i need to kind of question whether they're an expert or not yeah if they don't know in that regard how might they mislead me somewhere else They'll probably then tell you about new and noteworthy. Yeah, so let's go there. Tell me about new and noteworthy. We hear all the time it's a big boom for your podcast if you get in new and noteworthy. And there's some assumptions being made there. But tell us what you see from the stats. Shows that get featured in new and noteworthy, quote unquote, featured in new and noteworthy on sub pages, sub category pages, but not the main page of iTunes. At best, it's a bump of about 100 downloads. For that one episode or two or three episodes? For the episodes that get released during that point in time while they're on new, the new and noteworthy. And at best, 100. And if you're in a subcategory page, you're probably not even going to see that. Usually when they see that bump, it usually goes away after five episodes or later. If you get featured on the front page of iTunes, that will give you a bump. You get up on the header, that will get you a bump. But the front page and the header and all that is 100% hand curated by Apple. There's no way to game it. doesn't matter how many times you tell people to go put a rating or a review in. That's the other place that, where people mis mistake. They think that ratings and reviews are going to help bump you up in the top 200 list, which doesn't. Um, there's nothing you can do to game the front page of iTunes other than actually having real people go out and subscribe and listen to your podcast and it grow. Then Apple will take a look at your show and if they think it's worthy, then they'll feature it in the, on, on the new and noteworthy or the top of the iTunes. Getting featured there will give you a bump of a 1,500, 2,000, and that may be enough to get your show kickstarted and going. That's what happened with Lore. You know, Lore got featured after it had been out for a little bit. That kicked him off and that got the word of mouth going. But he didn't do anything. He didn't game anything. He didn't ask listeners to go rate and review. He didn't do any of that stuff. Just Apple noticed it, liked it, recommended it. Other people liked it, and they recommended it, and so on and so on. And word of mouth marketing is the only thing that works. That's really good to know. So, so you mentioned subscriptions as being the main thing. Why is that the case? The top 200 list, if you go into iTunes, and people get mis mistaken on this one, and this comes back, the top 200 list is based on the total number of new subscribers you've had in the last seven days with the weighted average of the last 24, 48, and 72 hours. People think this top 200 list has something to do also with rating reviews. It doesn't. It's just about new subscribers, not total number of subscribers all time, new subscribers. Within that time frame. Right. Within that wow. time frame. I've seen a show 
get into the top 20, it was like, I, I went one day and I, and I pulled all the shows that were in the top 100 and that hosted with Lipson. And then I looked at the stats on how many downloads each of those shows had for their most recent episode that was at least two weeks old or their most recent episode if it was less than two weeks old. So whatever the most recent episode was, if they had one that was at least two weeks old, what that was. And if they didn't, if they were just a brand new show, what was the most, you know, what was the numbers on that? And what I found was um, of our shows we had in the top 100, I think we had like 35 or 40 or so um, that day. When I looked at that, I found no trend that you could see between how many total number of downloads those episodes got and where they were ranked. There was a show at 12 that had two and a half million downloads, and there was a show at 15 that had 979. Hmm. That's quite quite a spread there. Yeah. And and there was others that had, you know, a couple hundred thousand that were in, in the 90 range, and there was others that had 2,000 that were down in the 20 or 30 range. So it w- literally was all over the place. You you could not chart or predict any numbers based on where they were. And and I, I, I do a, a graph of this and I put up the chart and I'll show without the numbers. And I'll say, here's where the shows are ranked. And then I'll put the numbers in and they're like, wow, and you see no trend. That's because it was based on how many new subscribers they had gotten in the last week, which can vary. And that show that it was 979 had just released in the last 24 hours. So the show was only one day old and all the downloads were to that last episode and all the people came in and subscribed. You know, people ask, why is this important? Well, it's important to understand how iTunes works if you want your show to be successful. And that is, you want to recommend people go to iTunes and subscribe to your podcast. A lot of people are like, oh, send people back to my site, or, or worse yet, they use an ITPC link, which bypasses iTunes. You want people to go into iTunes and click subscribe. And why is that? Because that's what Apple wants you to do. It's not a coincidence this works this way. Apple made this system very simply to drive people to iTunes so that when they go and click on your podcast, they may also go off and buy a movie or music or other things. You know, Apple didn't get 200 and something billion dollars in the bank by not liking money. They do things for a reason and understanding that. And it's not bad on Apple's part because it allows any show to chart, but you have to understand how it works. And, And sending your subscribers to iTunes is one of the best things you can do when you launch a new show. Yeah, that totally makes sense to me. Let me play devil's advocate a little bit or or ask you a, a philosophical question, I guess, because to me, this depends on what your goal as a podcaster is. Right. Uh, if I want people to land on my site so that they can see my online course and they can see my coaching packages and they can see my books for sale instead of sending them to iTunes, that's a, an individual preference and call to make, correct? Correct. Um, yeah, my I mean, goal at that point is not getting more subscriptions. My goal is selling more stuff. Yes, but you also have to look at it this way too. If you're trying to get word out about your site and you feel that your traffic to your site stagnant, you're launching this podcast as a way to then really grow your audience, then you want that podcast to get off to a good start so that it has a chance to grow virally in iTunes. And sending people to your website is going to negate that effect. Now, after you've launched a show for six months, yeah, you're not wanting to send people to iTunes all the time. But when you launch, say you have a mailing list that you've curated, your mailing list, not one you bought from some guy by the name of Steve who emailed you and said, hey, I got a mailing list of people that like iOS apps. Just a mailing list that you've actually hand curated. All the people know you. They have opted into this mailing list. Launching your podcast with a direct link to iTunes to that mailing list is a great way to push your show up in the charts on iTunes. Matter of fact, it's the only way I've seen work. That absolutely makes sense. And and let me finish this up by asking you, in your view of looking at the stats and, and understanding what you do about iTunes, what is the benefit of your show being higher in the standings in iTunes? Discoverability, people find it. Now, here's the other thing in iTunes. The total number of subscribers all time that impacts how your show ranks in search results. So when you go into iTunes and you search for iOS or iPad or iPhone, you're going to find this one little show called Today in iOS at the top of the rankings. Why? Because that show is is my show. I launched it 10 years ago. (laughs) And it was the first podcast about the iPhone. I have more total number of subscribers all time that people have gone and click subscribe to that show than any other show that covers iPhone and iOS and, and iPad. So how your your show is ranked in the search results 
is really determined by how many total subscribers you've had all time. So if you want to do better in search results, which is probably the, the number one way people find things outside of the top 200 list, you wanted to go ahead and, and make sure you get people to click subscribe. Since we're talking about subscriptions to iTunes, let me ask you a few related questions. What actually counts as a subscription in iTunes? I know if you go to the iTunes website and you hit subscribe on a show or you do that through your iTunes program, that's going to count. But what about if someone uses Pocket Casts or nope. you know, any of those? Nope. Overcast, Pocket Casts, Shifty Jelly Pocket Casts, none of those count. Only things that count is going to the iTunes store, clicking subscribe, or going to the podcast app and clicking subscribe. Because, as you said iTunes wants you on their site. They want you in their ecosystem, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And it's, it's unfortunate that it works that way on our side. I, because you know, a lot of people like me, for example, I never go to the iTunes store. I subscribe through my, my listening app, but I understand why Apple does that. So that does make sense. All right. Let's get back to stats. We'll jump off of iTunes for a bit. Tell me some of the most common myths that you hear perpetrated out there about stats. One would be that there's more uh, Android users. Uh, I've heard that one come up recently. I I don't know where that one came from. We see across our network, 4.38 to 1 was the most recent iOS to Android ratio. So a lot more downloads iOS to Android. And let let me ask you a question about that. It may just be speculation, but why do you think that is? Apple has always made podcasting easily accessible in their ecosystem. So, you know, Apple's done a lot to promote podcasting. I also think up until Google Play Music, there was no native way for people to discover podcasts on on Android. You know, right now, if you want outside of Google Play Music, if you wanted before that, if you wanted someone to subscribe to a podcast, you had to tell them download this third party app, then go find your show, which isn't good. You want it native. I mean, so the podcast app on Apple comes default when you buy an iPhone or an iPad or whatever. So that makes it easier. I think the other big misconception is what the typical number of downloads shows get are. People hear people out out there running around saying, I get all, I get 100,000, I get a million, I get 2 million. A lot of those people yelling those numbers aren't telling the truth. I always give this one story. When I started at Libsyn, uh, right before I started, I was at a conference uh, a few months before, and it was a guy running around, and he was saying, I get 60,000 downloads an episode, I get 60,000 an episode. And he, lip, he hosted on Lipson, and I'm like, man, this guy show sucks. There's no way this guy's getting 60,000. This was 10 years ago. Right? So, I mean, think about that. So, first day on the job, I went in his, into the stats. Uh, I looked up his numbers, and his best episode ever was 600. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, another thing is people tend to lie about their numbers. So, what we try to do at Lipson is I always try to give out what the actual median number is and what the mean number, average mean is. And so the median number is right around 200. That means half the episodes released with us get 200 or more and half get 200 or less. And I said to people, if you're getting over 500 downloads an episode, that's a successful show. I, I define successful at 500 because at that point, you've broken away from all your friends and family. You're beyond what most of the shows out there are getting. Um, you've created an audience that are interested in what you're talking about. Now, that doesn't mean if you get 150 that you don't have an audience that is interested in what you're talking about. I'm just saying, in general, without knowing the topic, I mean, granted, you could have a podcast on professional pig raising and 150 is, is, is super successful. But in general, generic topic podcast, if you're getting over 500 downloads, you have a successful podcast. Let's switch gears a little bit to go into the specific stats that Libsyn offers, for example, which most podcast hosting services probably offer something similar. And let's talk about why they're important. We've we've been talking a lot about downloads per episode, and you suggested a four-week window to look at to see what, what sort of downloads you're actually getting per episode. But you guys also have stats about geography and technology and traffic sources. So let's let's take those one at a time. Uh, geographic Tell us what we would find there and why it's important. Well, geographic, we're going to give you a breakdown on country in the U.S. We're going to give you a breakdown on state and then also down onto the city level. So you're going to be able to see how many downloads you got and where exactly those downloads are coming from. 
in, in city level, I should say, is a DMA. So it's the metro area. So um, you'll be able to see, for example, how many downloads you got in Cincinnati, DMA versus Dayton, Ohio versus Columbus versus Cleveland. And then you can see the total number in Ohio. And then you can see the total in U.S. And then you can see other countries as well and certain regions inside those countries. This is important for a couple factors. One, if you want to get an advertiser, some advertisers are only going to be certain country uh, Casper, it's going to be U.S. in in uh, Canada. That's all they deliver to. Uh, Hello Fresh would only want to know your numbers for the U.S. because they only deliver in the U.S. But then you may get an advertiser that's global, uh, um, like uh, Storyworth, that can deliver anywhere. So knowing where your downloads are coming from helps you if you ever want to monetize via advertising. But it's also just interesting to know how many you get. I mean, my son. For his podcast, he always likes to look at where he is getting downloads, which countries, and then he says thank you to a specific country on each episode. Yeah, that's cool. So you can have fun with that. But it, it's just neat knowing, oh, wow, I got I got a, a download from the Isle of Man. Yeah. yeah, really cool. I could also see if you're the kind of business or your your brand is such that you might host events, you could look at your geography and see where do most of my listeners download from, you know, where do they listen from? And perhaps plan your next event in that area so that you would have a higher likelihood of getting tickets bought. And comedians do that. That's one of the reasons comedians host with Libsyn is that that was what they told me is they like it because they're able to go to the, the nightclub owner and say, hey, I get 350 downloads an episode in St. Louis or I get X number in Minneapolis. And being able to say they have an audience in that city helps them book gigs. Yeah, which seems like, you know, a way to not necessarily ensure attendance at your event or, or or your gig, but it definitely is improving your chances. You're not just shooting in the dark that way. And, and people like Dave Ramsey and Joyce Meyer are doing that for their events, uh, where they're even geotargeting advertising to those areas um, so this, to promote that events coming there. So if you're going to spend, say, money on Facebook ads, you can use the Facebook ads thing to drill into audiences that are in that city interested in your topic and spend your money more wisely. Correct. All right, great. All right, let's talk about the technology. That that title, I assume, is talking about the type of technology being used to listen to your show? Those are user agents, right? So applications. That's where Overcast comes in and Shifty Jelly Pocket Cast and Stitcher and iHeartRadio and, and different applications that are being used. Safari, Firefox, Mozilla for the browsers. Um, you'll see Apple Core Media. Matter of fact, most podcasters will see Apple Core Media as number one and iTunes number two. The Apple Core Media is the podcast app from Apple. Okay. Matter of fact, one of the clear signs that someone's stats are wonky is when I go and look and Apple Core Media is not number one and iTunes is not number two. That usually is a red flag for me to look at their stats more closely. Um, if I see on a show where... 80% of their downloads are coming from a browser. I tend not to believe those numbers. Uh, those shows tend not to have real audiences. They tend to have a player. I'll go and research and they have a player on a web page that is auto loading when someone visits the website. Not that they're listening to it, but they're, they're getting these auto loads and I will not bring those shows into ad campaigns. So you're saying that the page is set or the player is set so that it begins playing the minute someone shows up on the page or preloads it in the background some of them some of the players some players are are bad where they'll preload and it doesn't even play some will be autoplay but yeah some people have autoplay and they'll take our player and they'll set it up for autoplay ours will not preload in the background but there are some third-party apps that do but ours tells not to auto auto load but when someone has it for autoplay that's another flag i'll go in and i'll look at the numbers usually and i can see the settings <laughs> it shows me the settings here's the refer and here's the settings it shows autoplay i'm like yeah um, yeah so they are truly gaming the system to inflate their download numbers sometimes they're gaming the system but most of the time they just didn't know what they were doing sometimes they pick a third party player that looked pretty but it was auto loading and i'll have to tell them now nah, you got to switch your player Sometimes they, they turned autoplay on because they thought people like that. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, it's hard to buy that one. But yes, uh, yeah, yeah, I think autoplay is, is annoying. If, is, is, yeah, me too. Is there, yes, it gets. Uh, all right. Let's talk also about why the technology stats are important. Why would someone even care how someone's listening to their episode? If you look through your stats and you don't see any downloads from Overcast or Shifty Jelly Pocket Cast, maybe your show's not in those directories. And you might want to figure out what's going on and why they're not in there. We always break down here the top players and we go, you know, it, it, it's 
obviously iTunes. You, you take iTunes and Apple Core Media, right? So let's put everything in perspective here. iTunes, Apple Core Media, that's going to be 68% uh, of the downloads in, in February is what we saw the last time I looked at it. So you take that, throw that aside. Next up, number two was Podcast Attic at 5.74%, then was Stitcher at 247 and then Pocket Cast at 1.44%, and then Overcast at 1.32%. Those were all the ones above 1%. So if you don't see downloads from Stitcher or Pocket Cast or Overcast, you might want to get your shows, make sure your shows are in there. Now, Pocket Cast and Overcast pull from the iTunes directory. So if you're not seeing that, something's really wrong. Stitcher, you have to go in and manually submit to Stitcher. By knowing and understanding where you're getting downloads, you're also knowing where you're not getting downloads. And you want to find out, you might want to find out why if you're not seeing downloads in those top user agents. Yeah, so if someone doesn't see downloads from Pocket Cast or, or one of those that pull from iTunes, how would they go about figuring out what's wrong? Get the app and then take a look and see if your show's in there, or how it's showing up, make sure it's showing okay. Reach out to the developer in those cases, or, or if you're hosting with Libsyn, reach out to me and then I can take a look and see what's going on. But yeah, you want to look at your user agent information to see if you're in there. And in most cases, you're going to be. But we've had cases where people weren't in a couple of apps they thought they should have been in. And what it came up to one of them was um, their title of their show was too long. They had gamified it with spammy tags. And that broke one of the applications out there and, and, and couldn't get in. So give me an example of gamifying the title, just so people are clear on what you're saying. Um, gamifying a title would be Rob's Awesome Marketing Podcast dash entrepreneur dash business dash Seth Godin dash Tim Ferriss dash Joe Rogan dash on and on and on. People will put all these keywords in their title or author tag. And sometimes those things will break other services. Like Spotify has a limit, for example, of how many characters you can have in the title. So for shows that we, we go to put in Spotify, I have to look at their titles and make sure they're, they're small enough. And I basically rip out any gamifying of, of keywords in the title. And by the way, this is probably something you're aware of as well, but it was probably six months ago or so that I had a client who had done that. I hadn't noticed it or else I would have you know, referred to her that she not do that. But anyway, she got a note from iTunes saying, you need to fix this in the next so many hours or we're going to take your show off of the listings. And uh, so, so iTunes is even cracking down on that. Here's a better one. I got an email from Apple this week and it said, Hey, we want to feature this show, but they're gaming their author tag. Remove it. We can't feature them. Wow. So even gaming the author tag, is it is it mainly the title and the author tag that are to be concerned about? Right. Because those are the ones that are most relevant in search results. So people know, okay, those are the only two things that affect search results. I'm going to put stuff in. Your author tag should be your name or your company's name. And that's about it. Your author tag should not have... Tim Ferriss or Zig Ziglar or Seth Godin or anything else or business or entrepreneur. It could be Carrie Green, entrepreneur, that's it. Or Carrie Green, author, but not Carrie Green, author, who sometimes interviews people like Tim Ferriss, Seth Green, uh, Seth Godin and, and stuff like that. So in this case, it was one where the person had both actually wound up having gamified both the title and the and the author. The author was just really bad. So I went back to them and said, hey, you got to remove all this stuff. And he cleaned it up. And I went back and said, okay, he's cleaned it up. And now we'll see if the show gets featured or not. Interesting. So when you say featured, you're talking about they're on the main page and that's that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah. So that matters for that as well. So yeah, just good lessons learned here for people to to understand. All right, let's move on to the next stat category, traffic sources. How is that different from the technology? Technology would be Safari, Mozilla, Firefox, Chrome. That would be what you would see in, in their technology. But that doesn't tell you where. Was that your website? Was that Facebook? Was that Twitter? Was that LinkedIn? Basically, it's, it's destiny. We call it destination stats. It tells you where that consumption came from. Was it from your RSS feed? Was it from iHeartRadio? If you have that as a destination, was it from LinkedIn? Was it from Twitter? Was it from uh, your web page or was it from your web player? So this way, now you know where those consumption came from, not just what user agent, but where, what was it, what destination that you pushed your content out to? Did you actually get consumption? Yeah. Okay. So if you are habitually sharing on say Twitter and you notice in your stats, you only get 2% of your 
plays or downloads from Twitter, you may want to rethink your Twitter strategy. Correct. Okay. That totally makes sense. And I, I, I'm very disheartened because I see LinkedIn is really low for me and I try to, I really try hard on the LinkedIn side to build up a, a group on LinkedIn, but I get very little consumption over there on LinkedIn. I get more consumption via Facebook and I don't like Facebook. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really matter what you like though. It matters what your audience likes, correct? Yes. That, and that's why stats are important because here I am, you know, before we had destination stats, I did all this work and all this pushing on, on LinkedIn. And then we run the stats out and then I see the numbers and I'm like, what? Oh, that means I have to go over to Facebook now and be more engaged. But yeah, it told me where people were actually cared um, and were consuming. So not where I wanted people to consume, but where people actually were consuming. And that's where stats come in. You know, it, it blows away your preconceived notions and, and gives you the data. Yeah. And if you're one of those, I'm just speaking to the audience here. If you're one of those podcasters who is just hell bent to do what you want because it's your podcast, hey, good luck with that. I mean, you're, you're free to do it, but you may not have the audience that you could have by ignoring where they want to listen. That's what I hear Rob saying on this one. So, Rob, let me ask you some questions about that. You mentioned player on your web page. You mentioned on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, all these places, the destinations that those plays could come from. Tell me how that works. What, what is it you have to share on Facebook in order for it to register as a play? Is it the download link? Is it a player embed? I mean, for people who don't know this kind of stuff. On lips inside, how we do things, we call it on publish and, and destinations. And what you can do is set up a different destination for Facebook where we'll actually take your audio file and we convert it to video and, and, and have it uploaded as video to Facebook. Which I love, the by the way. Thing. It looks great. And we do it for YouTube, which I love because I used to manually do that. So this all done automatic for you. You can set a custom message in your Facebook post like, hey, here's this episode, da, da, da. Um, you can do a custom message for Twitter and a custom message for LinkedIn. So when you release an episode, these custom messages go out with links to the files where people can play at those destinations. Or in the case of Facebook, it actually uploads it as native video to give you a better juice there. But it also goes out to iHeartRadio as a destination and uh, Google Play Music. Now, we don't get stats back from Google Play Music at this point in time, uh, hopefully in the future, but not yet. That's their side, not our side. And then we have a few other destinations. Of course, your web player. If you have the iOS and Android apps with us, the iOS and Android apps, which is the second biggest place where people consume for my show. And then, of course, the RSS feed. And this allows you to, to schedule or determine where your content goes out to. So maybe some content you don't want to go everywhere. Maybe some content is special and you have an app with us and you only want the content to go to the app. Or you may want to delay some destinations. Like I typically... Uh, publish my episodes around two or three in the morning, somewhere around there. Not the best time to be making a Facebook post or a Twitter or a LinkedIn post. So I time them to go at noon Eastern time, which is a good time to publish to Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn because East Coast is hitting lunch and the West Coast is just getting in. So I, I time things around that. So we're able through the destinations to control when content goes to different places. The Nerdist went one step further and they call, you know, it's called windowing what they did was they actually released their content to Spotify earlier than to every other destination to get special features and promotion from Spotify. Hmm. And that was a deal they worked out with Spotify. Correct. Really interesting. So if someone does that initially and say it posts to Facebook at the time they've scheduled in video form and all that sort of stuff, but they want to put it into a social media platform like eClincher or Edgar or something like that to continually be posting, what did they need to post there? Don't do that. Well, I don't mean continually posting on the same day. I mean like a week later or a month later to, to get evergreen content out again. What should they post in there? Would it be the download link or the direct link? Or I, I would not recommend the download link. If you post over and over and over again to Twitter, um, it's called Twitter bombing and it, it tends to inflate your stats. So you want, I always say one time you, you do the direct link to Twitter and, and Facebook. Uh, or now in this case with Facebook, now we actually upload it natively. But, but to Twitter and LinkedIn, one time you do it um, the direct link. And then after that, what I, I recommend is a, a link to either uh, your show in, in iTunes, if you're trying to su support iTunes or a link to your blog post where that episode is located. I, I think if you're going to re-mention an episode over and over and over in Twitter, especially if you're going to schedule it out where it's going to go in two weeks and then four weeks and then six weeks, 
put the link to your, your blog post. It totally makes sense. Where there's a player and then people can come and click play. And again, not a player that auto loads, <laughs> not one that loads in the background. Yeah. If you're with Libsyn, the Libsyn player will work fine for you. There's other players out there that work good too. Or Pat Flynn's player is a good one. But make sure it's a player that's not auto loaded. Yeah, totally makes sense. Now, you mentioned a, a phrase there I'm sure a lot of people are not familiar with, Twitter bombing. It does relate to stats. So why don't you explain to us real quickly what Twitter bombing actually is and why it's not a good thing? There's varying degrees of Twitter bombing, but the basic definition is someone that's going to be tweeting over and over and over multiple times an hour links to different different episodes that they've released. And I've seen some people where they tweet a hundred times or more an hour links to their episodes. That's insane. Yeah. And first off, nobody's going to be following you on Twitter if you're doing that. Right? <laughs> and, and some of them are using multiple accounts anyway. But when you do that, you've lost all value of Twitter. But there are some bots. Every time you put a link up there, there's some bots that will hit that. So what they found was, well, if I do this, my numbers go up. Well, kind of, yeah, your numbers go up. But some of those bots, unfortunately, which spoof different user agents, would cause numbers to go up. Now, I can tell a lot of times if people were doing that, I can look at their stats real quick and see it. And I would go and I would contact people and say, hey, I noticed you're doing this on Twitter you know, these numbers aren't real. And and sometimes that would be the call where I'm basically saying, did you know your baby's ugly? And and they didn't know their baby was ugly and they thought their baby was beautiful. And then I said, nope, nope, really no. It makes a, you know, a Mexican hairless uh, chihuahua look good. <laughs> so yeah, you know, so nope, y- your baby, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's pretty ugly. And unfortunately, some of those people would tell me, well, this is what, XYZ person told me to do in his seminar. And I and I'm like, oh my God, did you pay for that seminar? And like, yeah. I'm like, oh. And, and which brings me back to the other advice I always tell people. I go, the value of advice you get in the podcasting world is inversely proportional to the amount you spent on that advice. Mm. There's people out there that were just recommending that and selling that as a way to guarantee you grow your audience. And no, you weren't growing your audience, you're just growing some bogus numbers. Now, for the most part, people have stopped doing that because they realize it wasn't real and I've reached out to those. Um, and, and those that were doing it, when I see it, I, I blacklist them. They weren't allowed to be an ad campaign. So they're kind of blacklisted. I won't be presenting them in any ad campaigns at any time. Wow. And there's a couple that have realized that, that, you know, that they had no idea that what they were doing was wrong and then they had paid for that and they've changed their ways and, and they've gone back. And, and their numbers, as soon as they, they went back to doing it right, we're fine. And, and, and I always said to people, I go, look, if you really want to see if that's a real audience that you get from doing these tweets over and over, I go, replace the direct URL with the link to your iTunes store page and see what happens. And everybody that did that, the numbers went away. Hmm. Yeah, that totally... Because it wasn't real. Totally makes sense. So why why is this particular to Twitter and not Facebook or LinkedIn or anywhere else? Just the bots that run through Twitter. Huh. So there's, there's automated software that's... That's the stuff. The stuff that's out there, scraping and looking on a constant basis. And does it more on Twitter than the other social media platforms? That we can see. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Well, Rob, this has all been great information. What have I not asked you about stats that I should have asked you about stats? I think it comes down to why why you should not look every day. I, you know, going back to that. Just don't, don't, don't obsess over your stats. Look at trends. Don't look at the total number. I, I think trend lines is more important. Is your show growing? If it's not growing, try to figure out how to get it to grow. But don't obsess over the fact if you have 1,500 or 15 downloads at this point in time. Uh, work on creating great content. Ask your audience to help promote it. And don't check your stats every day. Just don't do it. Look once a week if you're a weekly show. See how your show did the last week. But don't don't be that person that when we pause stats for an hour, you're emailing me asking what's happening. <laughs> so it's kind of self-serving, huh? You just don't want to have to deal with all those emails. But I totally get the point, though. That's, that's it. And But I just feel bad for people that get it. You know, and I understand when you first start podcasting, you're going to be addicted to it. And it's really important. But don't, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Just break the chains. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the, your baby's ugly conversation, except in this case, you're saying you need a life. I would, I would take it almost to dieting. If you're going to eat a chocolate chip cookie every hour, 
you're going to find it hard to give up eating chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. If you're used to doing that. Now, if you can go a week without a chocolate chip cookie, you may find that soon you can go a month without a chocolate chip cookie. And you'll be in better shape for it. And, and I think you'll be in better shape if you can go a little bit longer without checking your stats. Now, I'm, again, check it for the right reasons. Check it to see where you are. Check it to see where, you, where you're not. And then do some promotions around the places you're not and see if, if you can help there. But even then, don't, don't be checking on a daily basis. Yeah. And so that kind of lends to the final question I was going to ask you. And that's to flip the coin around and look at the other side. What would you say to the person who never checks their stats? You got to check occasionally, otherwise you have no idea where you're not and where what, what's going on. So you do want to look occasionally, at least once a month to see how your show is doing. It tells you, there's so much information you can get when you actually look at your stats. But again, don't over obsess, but look, see where you are, see where you're not. And if you're hosting with Livson, if you haven't set up destinations, by all means, set up every destination you can go under destinations in your Libsyn account and then click add new for everything you can add to. Add um, a blogger page, add a Tumblr page. You know, one of the, here's a great one. I talked with a, a, an SEO expert last week at a conference and um, he, he broke the myth. I mean, he said, you know, the whole myth about if you double post content on two different blog pages, it will hurt you. Yeah. He's like, no, oh, that's, he goes, that's complete BS. He goes, there's no truth to that at all. Google will not hurt your your site's index or ranking because the same content was posted somewhere else. It won't boost you, but it won't hurt you. So get your content into Tumblr, get your content into Blogger. Those are free places you can publish your content to post to. And additional places may, people may stumble upon you. He goes, and for those that think, oh no, that's not true. Google really does punish you. That's because that's FUD that's out there that he goes, he goes, I don't know where the myth came from. He goes, but he goes, if that was actually true, he goes, there would be a whole industry created around finding competitors content and reposting it so that you would hurt all your competitor sites to boost you up. And he goes, and there isn't that industry out there. Yeah, that makes total sense. Now, let me get some clarification on what you just described there. So when you say set up a Tumblr page or a blogger page, are you talking about setting it up so that you set up those accounts, you link that to your Libsyn account so that when your episode publishes, it automatically publishes to those places as well? Correct. Yeah. And so what is it going to publish there? Is it just going to be a like what is in your description on Libsyn with a player? Yeah, the title and description of your episode along with the player. Wow. That's pretty cool because I, I had not thought of those two things, honestly, blogger and Tumblr. Granted, I know three quarters of people on Tumblr are there for the porn, but there is that other 25%. Yeah. And it also, you know, may rank in Google organic search and that's where they find you. Right. And that's why you publish to YouTube too. I know, that's why I always say to people, wait, why are you publishing your audio as video with a static image in YouTube? Because of SEO, because of search. You know, it's, it's, gee, YouTube has really good placement in Google search. There's a reason for that. Yeah. Yeah. Google happens to own it. Right. And they own, and, and they own blogger too. So, you know, that one has a little bit of an extra boost there. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that hack right there is, and it's not really a hack. It's just a piece of information we didn't know. I think that's worth the entire conversation. Not that everything else we talked about was worthless, but you know, that's a great tip. So Rob, I wanted to just point out that you guys do a podcast every week from Libsyn called The Feed. And if people who are listening are very interested in stats and want to keep up on what the averages and means and stuff like that are, Rob talks at the end of every episode about the current stats that are going on through Libsyn. And so Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about The Feed and where people can find it? All right. So if you can go to thefeed.libsyn.com, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N. And for those wondering, it, Libsyn stands for Liberated Syndication. So L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. So thefeed.libsyn.com. And that's where Elsie Escobar and myself, we talk, uh, we record every other Friday. Uh, so it comes out every other weekend. So uh, this show comes out every other weekend. Try to make it every other weekend. And we're at episode 93. And, and part of what we talk about is we answer people's questions. We talk about news in the podcasting space. And then at the end, uh, I talk stats for all the stat junkies and, and try to, we try to do some myth busting on the show. Uh, there's a lot of bad, bad articles out there on podcasting. Um, we talked about earlier how to tell if someone was bad, you know, when they're telling you that it'd be 20 or 25 minutes for an episode or new and noteworthy. And we, we go over some of the other ones that people will say, so you know what to avoid. And, and it's just, 
a fun community show that we do. And Elsie does all the hard work, the editing, and and I get to just show up on the Friday mornings and we record and, and she goes and does all the, the extra work. Yeah. And I could say one of my promos for your show, I guess, is that I enjoy it because it's it's kind of like that one trusted source that you find in the health industry. You know, there's so many things being said and you don't know if paleo is best or, ve- or vegan is best or whatever, because there's just so many quote unquote experts saying what they believe and what they they have found. But you guys are are talking from a stats point and you're talking from seeing the actual behind the scenes things with thousands and thousands of podcasters. So it's a trusted resource that folks can actually go to and get the real scoop. So that's what I appreciate most about you guys show. So thanks for doing that, Rob. And thanks for all your service uh, to the podcasting community. I know you've been around for a long time and people don't know you. They should. So, Rob, how could they get in touch with you personally? Very easy. Just email me, Rob, R-O-B, as in Robert, R-O-B at Libsyn.com. And if you have an iPhone or an iPad, uh, you can check me out at todayinios.com. That's my uh, podcast there. Or just search for iPhone or iOS in, in, in the iTunes app store, or the iTunes store. If you have an Android device, you will not like that show. <laughs> yeah, well, that's okay. That's okay. We Android junkies have our own shows, so I think we'll be good. Go to Android Central if you want an Android show. That's a good Yeah, one. okay. Rob, thanks so much for your time. This has been great. Gary, thanks for having me. Hello. So which of those two are you, the podcast addict or the apathetic person who doesn't care at all about your stats? I hope that you learned something powerful or significant for your podcasting plan on this episode of Podcastification. And you know what time it is. It is time for you to go and make it a podcastificating day. This show is brought to you by Podcast Fast Track, where my team provides professional podcasting services without the time suck. Full production, editing, and show notes all in one monthly subscription package. You can find out more at podcastfasttrack.com. Now go out and make it a podcastificating day. Audio editing and show notes by podcastfasttrack.com. Get 15% off your first month by mentioning this show. Now, let me ask you a question related to that and feel free to tell me no. But for those who want to be careful that they're doing this with integrity, are you willing to tell us what players they are that tend to be set up to auto load automatically? Uh, no, I would never give out those, those information (laughs) publicly. Just just wanted to make sure. Yeah. I mean, I can ask, right? Yeah. No, I'm not going to say that.